quickly go through it. In, in Numbers 11, I never forgot this. I think probably every pastor has read this. And in Numbers 11, 13, he's at the end of a long list of complaining to God, like, why did you put me in charge of these people anyway? I never asked for this job. And he's going on and on about it. And then in verse 13, he says, where am I even supposed to find meat to feed this crowd, crying out that I give them food to eat? If you plan to treat me like this, just kill me now. <laughs> Ever feel that way, anybody? Yeah. Some, some hands are going up. Because I, I really wish you just put me out of my misery so I don't have to live out of this distress. And if we were honest, we might not say it in those words, but there are times when we're just, we can get angry at God. Like, how come you're not coming through? I've been praying such a long time. And I'm not asking you to deny facts. I'm just saying, think of the bigger, excuse me, think of the bigger picture. That you're here for a purpose. And if the devil can distract you on the minors and get you to major on the minors, he can keep you away from the full flourishing. Because that's what it said, right? That I, I'm going to thrive after surviving. I don't want to just live a life. I want to be living a flourishing life in the Lord after surviving this perfect storm from hell. So you're... You're operating from a different kingdom, and the people in the world don't have the tools you have, and they're looking at you going, wow, you went through the same thing I did, but you don't seem to have the same reaction. That's the living out of the gospel. You're supposed to be an epistle read by all men. We'll get to that one. And, and Moses clearly has a reason to be frustrated. And then they come to him in Numbers 20, and they say to Moses, why in the world would you drag us out of Egypt into this wilderness where we'll soon die? After hearing them out, Moses and Aaron walked away. At the congregation tent opening, they collapsed to the ground and interceded for the people. So what would you have been asking God to do at that point? Nuke them? <laughs> Some of us might get like the apostles did that. Lord, can we call down fire from heaven? And he said, oh, you don't know the spirit that you're of. I'm here to save lives, right. Right? not to take lives. Right. So they fall down and they intercede. And when they intercede for the people, the eternal, this is the passion, I'm sorry, the uh, voice translation, he calls them the eternal. It's the glory of the eternal God shown for them to see. And he spoke to Moses. So God is speaking to Moses directly. Whoa, and Aaron. You and Aaron, grab the staff before the covenant chest. Gather the whole group so that all the people can see and hear you. And then what does he say? Say it with me, all right? Speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. Why would you speak to a rock? Because God told you to. Right. <laughs> you don't need any other reason. But that's why it's so important to know that you're hearing God and not your flesh and not the devil and how to hear. And that's why we fast. And we were in the men's ministry Saturday, yesterday, and two different people unknowingly gave a testimony about what happened to them during this year's fast, the first 21 days of January. And they credited the fact that we were in this fast and God showed them something. Isn't that cool? It was an awesome meeting yesterday for the men. So you guys, you know, Thursday mornings we do a call. It's been really great. You can, you can join the Zoom call, and then once a month we're going to be meeting here as well. So they get the order to speak to the rock. And then God says to them, tell it to release its water for them to use. In this way you'll get water from the rock for everyone to drink, including all the animals. So Moses took the staff just as God told him. Then he and his brother gathered all the people in front of the rock. And Moses, talking to the people, says, listen up, you rebellious lot. So that's probably not a good precursor of the kind of condition he was in. But do you get that way sometimes? Let's just be honest, folks. Yes. Okay, we don't become perfect people when we're Christians, but we get tools to know how to pause before the Lord and say, I don't want to minister in the wrong spirit. I want to do it from your heart. I don't want to manipulate people. I don't, you know, wow, long list of things that you could minister from the wrong spirit. Lord, I want your heart to be reflecting through me to them because that's the real change. That's when the real change happens. So... Should we get water from you from this rock, he says? And as he spoke, Moses raised his hand and hit the rock. Once, twice, and immediately the water came gushing out. They, they all drank their fill, people and animals alike. But the eternal one scolded Moses and Aaron for their actions because you didn't trust me. I don't know if you would have thought of that being what God would say. How did they not trust him? He said, speak to the rock. But there was enough bubble and anger and frustration on the inside to strike the rock. So he was disrespecting God by doing that because he was reflecting the wrong spirit to the people. 
And I had that picture of God when I was growing up, that he was angry, and I was hoping to just avoid him. So if I slipped by again today, I didn't get squished. No, that wasn't a healthy way of thinking about it, of an angry God that's ready to punish instead of a loving God whose arms are open and ready to, to receive me. And I think, you know, we could talk about it another day, but there's, a, there's a, an increase in what God expects of us the longer we serve him. That's in James. He said, be careful if you're going to be a teacher because you're going to be held to a higher standard. I don't want my people hearing something that you just cooked up in the kitchen. I want you to teach the truth of the word because he cares about you all and, and all of us, right? So the person who gets up here should have a fear of the Lord that you're not doing it for your agenda. You're representing God's agenda. And that's a very humbling thing, don't you think? And uh, you don't want to be wrong like they were. And then I'm going to just tie it in with a New Testament uh, picture that probably most of us know and just try to share the picture that the Lord gave me around this. It's John chapter 7, also in the voice. It says in verse 37, on the last day, the biggest day of the festival, that was the Feast of Tabernacles in the Bible that Jesus was attending, Jesus stood again and spoke aloud, if any of you is thirsty, come to me and drink. If you believe in me, the Hebrew scriptures say the rivers of living water will flow from within you. How many know what that means? Yes. What is it? Say it out loud. Holy Spirit, right? Rivers of living water will flow out of you. Isn't that a picture of what happened in the Old Testament? When the rock opened up and water came out. And there was a time in Exodus 17 when God did tell, did tell Moses to strike the rock. Right? So there was a history there. But this time God said, speak to the rock. And that little difference made a big difference. Right? Because as a leader, you're held to a standard that, you know, God's trusting leaders with you all, which are the most priceless thing in his mind. People, body of Christ. But if you're healthy, you're going to increase the body of Christ because other people are going to see how amazing God is through you. So mistreating them is not okay. Mistreating you all is not okay. And, and here's the picture, okay? So I've been in enough Bible studies to hear this about Moses. And they're in a desert, Right? The water is not far from the surface, but what's blocking it? Rock, right? And they don't have a jackhammer. They, even though the answer is not far away, it's below this impenetrable surface with natural tools. And God is saying, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water, right? But if we get judgmental and legalistic and, and we... Give other people an image of an angry God that hates them, and if they don't say yes to him and they get hit by a bus tonight on their way home, you're going to die and spend eternity in hell. Like That's really not a coherent picture with the way Jesus spoke to people. That's not wrong. I mean, it's, it's true that they need to accept the Lord, but are we modeling something that they feel is coherent with a message of love? And I'm not saying just tell them whatever they do is okay. But when we are obedient to him, that rock disappears and the water of, of life comes out of us. That's pretty exciting, don't you think? That God would use me and you. Many of you probably feel like me, that if I didn't get saved, I wouldn't even be alive today. That's how bad my decisions were. So the fact that I'm not just alive, but he would actually use me to help other people to find him, which is the greatest thing anybody could ever find, right? There's no better news than the gospel. And yet he would use me if I'm surrendered. That's really where I'm going to go. I have to be the person who will let the, the water flow through the right channel, right? And not that angry channel that, that Moses fell into because I'm in a bad mood or because things aren't going the way that I was expecting them to go. So just a couple of New Testament verses and, and we'll try to bring, tie it up and, and see if it makes sense to you. All right, so this is one, I'm guessing I already quoted it, so you probably knew it. 2 Corinthians 3 says, Paul talking to the Corinthians, not an easy book to read because he's upset with them, and he's, he's doing a lot of correcting in 2 Corinthians, right? But here he's saying, you are our epistle written in our hearts. That's beautiful language, isn't it? So he was there, he won them to the Lord, and he's saying that the evidence of your serving the Lord is, is an open epistle, like, you guys are the epistle, not something written down. You're written on our hearts, and you're known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ. You know what I'm talking about, right? So that people could watch you, and they're reading the Bible in your actions. 
Well, they're reading something in our actions. Right. <laughs> we want it to be the Bible. Yeah. So maybe take a fast from Facebook for a little while. And look back on your comments and say, was I reflecting an epistle in, in, in those comments? And look, I'm not trying to be condemning. I'm just saying everything matters to God. Yeah. Everything we say, like every word matters. So be careful. Let's all be careful that you don't do what Moses did and let your emotions get in the way and release the wrong thing when he cares so much about other people and how we treat them. All right, so clearly you're an epistle of Christ and basically he's saying ministered by us. In another translation it says we were the ones that were writing it down, written not with ink but with the spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. That is of the heart. And look, you know, I don't know how to explain it easily, but you all know that Jesus wasn't religious, right? He, he had a relationship with the Father, and that's what got us in the kingdom. Religion, you know, kills. The letter of the law without the Spirit kills. The Father's seeking for those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's important to know the truth, but it's also important to deliver it with oil. There's got to be some compassion. There's got to be uh, an ability to say, Lord, not just what to say, but how to say it, and deliver the truth, but do it in love. Don't tell them what they're doing is okay if you know they're in sin. That's not loving them. But do it in a way that they can hear you. I could show you so many examples of Jesus doing that in Scripture. But for now, let's just think about this one. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Can you say all things? All things. Look at somebody say all things. all things. That's an important phrase. Everything you need, He's already given to you. But are we accessing it? Are we unpacking it properly? Do we understand it properly? And, you know, if I had to give a scene in a movie, which you know I like to do because it's easy to remember, you might remember the movie Sully. And, you know, we're so close to New York City here. It was that miracle on the Hudson, 2,800 feet in the air. They hit a flock of geese, and 208 seconds later, they were on the water in the Hudson River. So that's three minutes and change, right? You didn't have a lot of time to think. Anybody know the scene I'm talking about in the movie when he's sitting before the Inquisition and they're running the models and they're showing him, whoa, we did the simulation and the simulation shows you could have made it to Fort Lee and you could have made it to LaGuardia. And it's like, oh, really? Because I love the scene. He goes, let's get serious after they make the charge. He goes, let's get serious. And, and everybody in the audience is like, what are you talking about? You know, he said, basically, you took away the human factor. Nobody has ever lost two all engines at 2,800 feet with a full load in a plane that size. You ran your simulation, but I'm curious, how many times did they get to practice the simulation? They knew immediately that they're supposed to turn. How many times? Remember the number? 17 times. They already knew what to do, and it still took them 17 times to practice it. And the whole audience is going, oh my God, how did we miss that? Where's the human factor? And that's what I want to just say today, is that's missing in a lot of, of, of the religious approach to talking to people about God. You can't forget the human factor. You have to build a relationship with people. They've got to know you and trust you and, and respect you if you expect them to trust what you're saying. And it's not just a simulation on a computer, right? So they said back and forth, and so they, he says, all right, well, how about this? Can you give me a little time to react? I'm about to die. This has never happened before. No one's ever trained for this. Do you think you could build a little time into the simulation? So they gave him 35 seconds. That's like a half a commercial. 35 seconds to save 153 or 155, I forget now. All those things are going through your head at the same time. He didn't have time to open the glove box and look in the manual. He had to react. Boom, boom, boom. Right at one, right after another. And it's ironic because he's a glider pilot by training. You know, talk about the right person at the right spot. And in fact, they looked at it afterwards. If he had done what was in the manual, they would have all died. But because he was so familiar and he so reacted, it was second nature saved 155 people. And I don't know if you see the movie, at the very end, they bring the survivors 
into the airplane hangar, and he says, it really hit me, it wasn't just the people on the plane that we saved, the ripple effect of all those other people that were related to them that were there, and, and you see somebody's face come up, and she says, 15B, 22C, all the different, blah, right? Because one guy kept his cool, didn't panic, it's really hard not to panic when you think you're about to die. And that's what Holy Spirit will do for us. That's what I'm asking you to do, is trust him not to just give a religious answer, speak the word, do it in love, but also say what we said today. I'm not enough unless you come. But when you come, boy, we can get great things done for the kingdom, right? <clears throat> you heard the joke about the flea on the back of the elephant, and they had to go across this rickety bridge and they go rumbling over it, and, and the flea looks at the elephant and says, boy, we really rocked that thing, didn't we? You know? We've taken all kinds of credit that we don't deserve. But being willing to be there in the middle as God is speaking through you, right? If you, got, if you ever get arrogant about it, remember that the donkey that spoke in the Old Testament was still a donkey after he spoke. Selah. <laughs> He's given me and you all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's such an awesome thing to think. I don't know how to apply it all yet, but it's been given to me. So if I dig in the word, that I could find the treasure of the word. For all the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you might be a partaker of the divine nature. When Moses struck the rock, he was not partaking of the divine nature. That was his carnal nature. His frustration and his anger was coming up to the surface. It doesn't mean that you, you, don't, you can't ever be angry, right? Because the Bible says, be angry and sin not. It also says Jesus was angry and never sinned. How many of you find it a little harder than Jesus probably found it? Yeah, so let's just be careful, right? That we don't think, well, it's a righteous anger. Okay, stand before the Lord someday. Hopefully he agrees with you. <laughs> I'm going to just cut through this one a little faster. Um, it's in the message translation, and it's that picture that sounds really hard to do when Paul said, I became all things to all people that I might win. Anybody? Some. <laughs> and you're like, wow, would have thought he would have said all. But he's recognizing all we can do is our part, right? And one plants and another one waters and, and God gives the increase and we're going to stand before the Lord someday and he's going to say, okay, well, you were alive during the biggest crisis in your lifetime, in my case, a really long time. What did you do to help people understand there was a better message? Because you're probably never going to have a more open time than right now to talk to people about how important the Lord is in their lives. They just lived through a year of lockdown and fear is just rampant still, Right? And I, don't shame them. Don't shame people if, just because you don't agree with the way they're thinking about mass or the other things. It's like, no, this is an opportunity to talk to another person that God loves. And he really cares about how we approach him. So he says this, Paul, I voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. And then he lists a long list there that I spared you of. But he said, I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. That is profound. Not everybody's taught that. You know, when I was a new Christian, I was taught to go to the park and hand out tracts and, and give people the message, which is fine. I'm, again, I'm not criticizing that. It's still evangelism. It's good to do it. But it's that Holy Spirit peace, that little bit of a different peace that really can cross us over and not just look like uh, it's too mechanical. People are not mechanical. They're, they're alive. They're hurting. They don't know whether they should share their heart with you. But one of the ways you know this is working, but people, people will be talking to you and they'll say, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I never say this to anybody. Wow. You know, so that's a sign that the Lord is there, right? Yeah. That there, there's something happening in the transaction where they trust you. I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world. 
this could be 30 seconds, right? Like, the, it's not a big, long thing. It's just asking the Lord, show me what you see. I don't want to look at what I'm seeing. I want, I want to see what you see when you look at that person. Because I don't want to strike the rock. When you say speak to the rock. The water's just right here, ready, flow out of me. Rivers of living water. That means the word you use could save someone's life. Right. Oh, that's a pretty big responsibility, but I'll tell you what. Be prayed up before you leave the house in the morning. Right. And if you're driving towards New York, really be prayed up. <laughs> you lose your salvation on Route 3. I'm just going to finish uh, on this last part because of the time, but thank you, Nate. Every time I say I'm about to finish, Nate goes, ah, I love that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, one, one last story. I've told it to some of you, but maybe not everybody heard it. And it, I wish I'd made it up because I would be really creative if I had made this up, but I did it. But it really speaks to what I'm saying. So you, you saw the image of what happened in the movie Sully, it was really just the insurance companies didn't want to pay the claim because if they could prove that he could have made it back, they didn't have to pay the whatever it was. I think it was $300,000, I don't remember. Big number. And uh, they run this simulation, and you know anybody in Sully's point would have said, what are you kidding? You've never had to do anything like this. You don't know what it was like to be in that cockpit. And then they actually played the tape of them in the cockpit in that 308 sec 208 seconds that they had. And then the people on the, on the panel, the inquisitors, basically go, wow, that's the first time we ever played one of these tapes when the pilot was still in the room. <laughs> oh, man. And they asked the co-pilot, is there anything you would have done different? Remember this one? And he says, yeah, I would have had it done in July instead of January. <laughs> so he kept his cool, right? And then, I don't know if you saw The Millionaire, the first time somebody won a million dollars on The Millionaire show was an accountant, this guy's name was John Carpenter, and Regis is getting all pumped up and he's all excited, and you know, if, you, if you're wrong, you're going to go all the way back down to 32000 He had already won a half a million dollars. And, and the guy says, no, nah, I'm going to take the chance for the million. And he gives him the question, and he sits back and says, I'd like to use my lifeline, I want to call my parents. And then he says, I want to call my father. And, and Regis is like all pumped up. You know, your son's about to win a million dollars. And the father's all excited. And he says, okay, you got 30 seconds. Read your father the question. And the guy goes, hey, Dad, how you doing? <laughs> Not in any hurry. I don't really need your help. I just wanted to tell you I'm about to win a million dollars. I'm telling you, it's awesome. It's being present to the moment. See, like how many people would be that? calm inside when you're about to, nobody had ever won a million before. But like he just thought it through. He was present. He wasn't panicked. And then the last one I'll give you before I read this last verse is when I was 17 years old, I was uh, at a concert, played guitar, right, even then, and there was two people playing in a small theater. One was Les Paul, the guy that made the guitars, who was a legend, and the other was George Benson, who was also a, a, a legend. But it was only a 100-seat theater where we were. They weren't that well-known. And that would have been 74 or 5. So you're all doing the math of how old I am. <laughs> so um, we tried to sneak in the back door and ask Les Paul if I could go in as his son so I wouldn't have to pay for the ticket. <laughs> and he laughed. He thought that was really creative, but he said no. And so we had to pay. And... Uh, as they did their set, and they were about to take a break, and before they walk off, this, that was a stage. This is not. <laughs> George Benson just felt like telling a story, and he said, when I was 19 years old, which would have been, I don't know, at least 10 years before that, where we were, he said, I was playing uh, a, a jazz concert with Miles Davis and John Coltrane, and he was the guitar player at 19 on the stage with those guys. And that, the way jazz works is it's very improvisational. There's just a structure of chords, but then each player gets to take a solo, and everybody in the audience is sophisticated enough to know when that solo ends, they'll, they'll give you a hand. And then when, So Miles Davis goes, everybody claps. John Coltrane goes, everybody claps. And now it's George Benson's turn, right? So you'd be a little nervous, wouldn't you, after those two guys? So he goes third. And now the audience claps louder for George Benson than the other two. 
That's pretty cool, right? So they go for their break, and John Coltrane, who became a Christian before he died, after a really rough life, he looked at George Benson and said, Hey, kid, that was really good. Don't ever do it again. <laughs> now, I know why most of you are laughing right now, because you think John Coltrane somehow felt stood up. Not the case. See, like, we just assume that. Jazz is improvisational. You never play the same thing twice the same way. It's part of the art, is that you won't do that. And it's so Holy Spirit, right? Because the, if this exact same group of people showed up next week, it still wouldn't be the same group of people, because we'd be a week older. Right? And things would have happened during that week. We're the same bodies, but like this is how much God cares. And he was saying, don't sell out your soul. And I'm sorry if you're in a wedding band, but that could kind of be how it feels. Like, why am Like, I don't want to be that guy. You know, like you're playing the same song the same way every week. And if I burn that picture in as, as a religious Christian, good. Because, you know, like you don't accomplish anything if you don't take a risk. And we just get so worried about our reputation. And what if this and what if that? And what if I don't do it wrong? Well, what if you don't say anything? Then the living water was right below the surface. But nothing broke through because you have to take that initiative to break through. Speak to the rock. Don't strike the rock. Oh, thank you. Talk to Danny Hall sometime about the challenge of working with me. <laughs> so grateful for his patience. So this says, our ancestors were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, right? This is 1 Corinthians, so Paul's talking to a group of pretty carnal Christians, right? There weren't a lot of Jewish people in Corinth, but the believers were, were, were sincere, but they were operating out of their flesh a lot. There's a lot in, in 1 and 2 Corinthians about the gifts of the Spirit and trying to help them understand that. So he's like, our ancestors were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through a sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses, which, you know, there's other ways you could say that. But the point is, they made it out the other side. Now, we're coming up on Passover, right? That's the first of the three big feasts that Jesus told us to celebrate, that the Word of God tells us about. It represents deliverance coming out of Egypt. How many of you were in Egypt? I'm not talking about the real country now, just in case you're wondering. No, right? You were in sin. You were slave to sin. And any Egyptians here, please don't be offended if we're going to use that uh, politically correct angle. We're not talking about real Egyptians. We're talking about what it represented, slavery, for hundreds of years. And boy, this is a big celebration because nothing else could get them out but miracles. And it was the blood on the door. Like, oh boy, pretty clear picture there, huh? So they came out, they walked through the sea on dry ground and the cloud in the sea and all of them were baptized as followers and all of them ate the same spiritual food. That would have been the manna, right? And all of them drank the same spiritual water for they all drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. Can you picture that? Now today, we're still traveling with the spiritual rock because he says right there, that rock is Christ. And Christ has allowed you to become a partaker of the divine nature. But you have to throttle your anger. And, you know, some of us have to need a bigger throttle than others for that anger. And that's okay. Look, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we'd like to just say, well, no, that's just not how I'm wired. That's not my temperament. Look, like I said, you're coming out the other side resurrected. You need a new passport picture because you're not the same person. You're alive in God. Speak to the dry bones and tell them to live. That's how all of us are. Come on, let's stand up and, and let's just seek the Lord about actually trying to apply this in our everyday life. That's the hardest part about all of this. We're so easily just going to the computer simulator or we're playing YMCA the same way for the 500th time. It's like, no, Lord, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be a religious st structured person where, where that becomes the law, the letter that kills but I also don't want to be the fruitcake person out here who's just not tethered to any reality of the word, right? Because there's extremes on both sides. And 
you know, the charismatic Pentecostal movement has had plenty of black eyes from people that got caught up in the excess of the Holy Spirit peace. But look, we're, we have to live now here, today, in this region. And there's a lot of intellect and a lot of wealth and, you know, all people on all different parts of the spectrum. Every one of them is special to God. The Bible says he doesn't want one person to perish. Not one. So think of the person you want to perish right now. If you're angry at somebody, it's like, well, it wouldn't be a bad idea. No, that's not sowing and reaping, right? Let's just, let's just dig in and say, Lord, it doesn't matter what I'm seeing in the natural. I know you can change anybody. Yeah. Like you have this amazing ability to be present to every moment in my life. So let's just lift our hand and ask the Lord. Just say, Holy Spirit, come in in a fresh way. I need you to enable me to look past the person's image and see what you see and speak to their heart, not to the package. Lord, your word says, when I open my mouth, you will fill it. Help me, Lord, not to strike the rock when you say to speak to the rock. All right, so... I just want to give you your marching orders. So, like Trisha said, the power of testimony is really strong. Let's try to live the week where we can come back next week and talk to people and say, man, I tried what he said. It worked. It was really cool. I didn't get the response I thought I was going to get because I took a little risk. And I, and I, and I went out on a limb for Jesus. 